So uh, let's start and uh, today what we will review, I imagine that a lot of this stuff you have already seen, eh? but Ranjit uh, <coughs> uh, Daemi advised me to um, go through it. Eh? In case I go too uh, quickly, uh, just uh, you let me know. Well, I told say, please slow down, okay? <laughs> Otherwise, uh, so don't be afraid of um, uh, doing this. Now, so what we will do is we will go to what is called the Galilei relativity principle. And the Galilei relativity principle, it applies to non-relativistic mechanics, non-relativistic. That is the mechanics you have studied up to now. That means mechanics in which particles move at a speed much less than c. And the Galilei relativity principle says that uh, uh, it is impossible This is, if you want, a phenomenological um, description. It is impossible to detect differences in the law of motion It is impossible to detect differences uh, in the laws of motion in system moving with constant speed one with respect to the other. Okay, so that means uh, you have a frame, for example, the laboratory frame, this room in which you are addressed, and you have another frame moving with constant velocity with respect to this one. Then <coughs> if you have a particle doing some motion and you have the law of motion, it is impossible to detect any difference in the law of motion looking at this particle that moves from this frame or this other frame. These uh, things uh, is a sort of phenomenological um, uh, formulation, but there is another one uh, that, uh, that is more mathematical precise, and I prefer this. The form of the law of motion do not change. going from one frame to another, moving with constant velocity. with respect to the first. Let's see if the English, the form of the law of motion don't change going from one frame to another, moving constantly with respect to the first. This is more mathematical because it means, look, the law of motion, Newton's law of motion is m dx squared d2 squared. And it says that if you go in a new frame, you will have new quantity but the form of the law of motion is the same. OK? So it means this second, these two are equivalent. This is more physical or phenomenological. This is more mathematical. It says, look, the law of motion in non-relativistic mechanics don't change 
if you go from one frame to another that is moving with constant velocity with respect to the other. Okay, so this is the Galilei relativity principle, and um, um, it is experimentally verified. And so it uh, was promoted to be a sort of postulate, but it is experimentally verified. And uh, is easy to um, check. Uh, by the way, systems that move with constant velocity, one with respect to, uh, to the other, are called the inertial system. OK. Now let's uh, see how we can verify it. So let's take away these more phenomenological things and let's stick to the more mathematical one. So it's called relativity because somehow these two systems are totally equivalent. There is no manner that you can distinguish them because the form of the law of motion is the same. The form. The form, it means, uh, you know, here there is a second derivative, here there is a second derivative, here there is a coefficient that does not change, that is the mass, and here there is an object, is the force, that of course the force, in the first case you measure the force in this frame, in the second you measure the force in this frame, but actually the two forces are the same. You have extra forces only when there is an acceleration involved, and here there is no acceleration involved, okay? So let's take, for example, the free motion. The free motion is this if there is no force. Now let's make, um, let's go to the new coordinate. So this one is x and t. This one is x prime and t prime. This is, is the new frame. So let's see how this change. So this is the free particle. Let's see how this change when we go into the new frame. The new coordinate, x prime, you see there, is x minus v of t. If you take a point here and you want to measure its coordinate, this one, <coughs> you see that it's the same as x coordinate, but you have to subtract the piece that was done by the translation, that is v t. So we... Uh, here there is the hypothesis that at t equals zero, the two frames are one over the other, they are uh, superimposed, and then uh, you, at time t equals zero, they start moving. Then if you measure the distance here, so this is x prime, and this is x, then the relation is the following, that x prime is x minus vt. Let's use this and replace that here and see which uh, law we get. So we can invert x is equal to x prime plus vt. Now let's insert this here. Let's insert that here and we get m. Then we have dx prime the second derivative of dx prime dt prime. Then we have the second derivative of this, but this is only first power, so it gives zero. So we are left with zero. So this is the law of motion in the new frame, and you see that are the same, okay? So that confirmed the relativity principle of Galilei that says uh, two systems in relative motion, one with respect to the other, uh, at constant speed, have the same law of motion. They don't change. But what does not change, I mean, you see, x prime change, but it does not change the form. Here is second derivative, here is second derivative. It's not that uh, we develop a new form in which uh, there is, a, so basically, if the law of motion is something like g, x, x dot, x double dot, mass equals zero, that they, that they keep the same form, it means this g, is the same. The new quantity change. And also the mass could change. So the g, the form of the function. So this imagine is the law of motion that in, uh, has the position, the velocity, the acceleration, and the mass. And this sum combination equals zero. The form this g, that is the form of the function, is the same. But the variable are the new one. So you see? Yeah. 
the variable are the new one, but the form is the same. It's the multiplication of the mass times this uh, second derivative. If we had, if in doing that, we had developed something like plus k dx prime dt, then we would be in trouble because then the form of the law of motion is not the same. So that is the Galilei relativity principle. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, it was not so clear to Galilei and um, uh, Galileo and uh, so on, but um, somehow it became clear when things started going wrong in the sense that uh, um, at the end of the 18... Uh, well, <clears throat> so these uh, basically... So let's say the form of the law of motion the form do not change going in going from from one frame to another with constant moving with constant velocity. Now, <clears throat> here, uh, um, I said the transformation is the following. x prime is equal x minus vt. And if you have a particle, for example, uh, in, um, let's see, this is how the position of the particle transform. Let's see how the velocity transform. Suppose this is the velocity of this particle will be equal to the velocity of the other particle minus v. This is the composition law of the velocity. It's clear that if a particle moves with speed w1 prime in this frame, it will move in the other with speed w minus v because the frame is moving, okay? One with respect to the other. This is the composition of velocity. Well, what happened is a big surprise happened with the Maxwell equation. With the Maxwell equation, they realize that they are not invariant under that transformation. So they seem to violate the Maxwell relativity principle. Uh, and uh, not only, the velocity did not compose in this manner. For example, they discover via an experiment due to Michelson and Morley that C prime, the velocity in the new frame, is the same as c, and c is uh, the usual velocity of light, 3 roughly tens to the 10 centimeter per second. So there is an experiment uh, where they prove, uh, basically, that the velocity of light does not change um, from frame to frame. And second, uh, are not in the Maxwell equation are not invariant under Galilei transformation. When I say Galilei transformation, it means this, especially this. Uh, so uh, what happened is that Lorentz, before Einstein, just as a, he was a physicist, but as a mathematician, found which are the um, um, transformation under which the Maxwell equation are invariant. And uh, now we will uh, <coughs> derive them as um, he did. Um, basically, we will go in detail into a moment. We will see that there is a slight modifi modification of the Galilei transformation. That modification is due to Lorentz. And it goes back into the Galilei transformation when the velocity is low. But basically, there was these extra things. That means the velocity of light somehow different than the other velocity don't, compose, don't get composed in this manner, moving from one frame to the other. But they remain the same. 
So, um, what uh, Lorentz did, well, you can take the Maxwell equation. From the Maxwell equation, you go to the wave equation for the electric or the magnetic field. And then uh, you realize this wave equation uh, is invariant in a different set of transformation. But let's first, uh, so this is the Galilei relativity principle. Let's see which will be the new, relati the new relativity principle. Let's call Lorentz Einstein relativity principle. Well, the first one. The first, it is made of two parts. The first one is the same as the Galilei one, in the sense that uh, you cannot, the form of the equation of motion remains the same when you move from one frame to another, moving with constant velocity to the other. But the second postulate is C does not change going from one frame to the other. Now, what we have to do now is to derive these two composition law, and we will do. But this is the new relativity principle. Mm. And uh, if you use this new relativity principle due to Lorentz and Einstein, <coughs> then you will see that you recover this when the uh, velocity of your point particle is uh, much less than the velocity of light. Okay, So the first one is the same, that the form of the law of motion don't change in going from one frame to another. Uh, to another one moving with constant velocity, constant in time, okay? And the second postulate that they had to do is chi does not change in going from one frame to the other. The transformation will be different, and I will write down then. Then we will derive x. The new transformation is the following. x prime is equal to x minus vt divided by a factor that is 1 over v squared c squared. And the same, we will derive the composition law of the velocity. Maybe I can write, but then we will derive it. OK. Now, let's see first. <clears throat> now, all the two are related. I mean, they cannot be in contradiction. So from this one, we go into this when v is much smaller than c. So you have two frames, one moving with respect to the other. But v, the velocity of one, is much less than c. Then we will see that the Lorentz-Einstein relativity principle goes into this one and the transformation of those one. Let's uh, first notice uh, one thing. Um, so all this was triggered by the fact that the uh, Maxwell equation are not invariant under the uh, those transformation, the non-relativistic one, and second by the experiment of Michelson and Morley that I will not. It was an interferometer experiment, but I will not uh, waste the time on that. If you you can read in those books, especially the one that the PDF is available in the library, the one of Schwartz, you can read the detailed analysis of the. Um, Michelson Morley experiment. One thing that immediately, um, one immediate consequence of this is this fact the fact that the velocity of light is the same irrespective if you move with respect to the source or if you are addressed with respect to the source of light is that simultaneity is not anymore a concept that is invariant with respect to the change of frame. That means two events that are simultaneous in this uh, frame, the laboratory frame, are not simultaneous in a frame that um, uh, moves with constant velocity. Let me show you how it goes. Then we will go in detail in deriving this, OK? So. Uh,
first one. Okay, so let's see a first consequence, and it's a consequence of this. Uh, the consequence is the following events, which are simultaneous in one frame are not any more simultaneous in another frame, in another inertial frame. We use the word inertial in the sense with the meaning that uh, it is um, one is moving with respect to the other with constant in another iner constant velocity, inertial frame. Okay, let's, this, so this is a sort of theorem derived from this postulate. Let's see how it goes. Okay, let's take um, two events. An event is uh, something that is uh, characterized by a position in space-time and uh, time, okay? So, and let's put somebody here. And uh, let's suppose two events are simultaneous. Then let's suppose that when they happen, this person sends a beam of light to this, and these, per and these uh, events send another beam of light to this, okay? Now, <coughs> this man sits exactly in between the two, so the two are simultaneous. That means when he will reach the signal from them, okay? So this one, there is an event here, and when it happens, it sends a beam of light to this person, and the beam of light will take an interval of time that is this length, L over 2. This is L over 2. So L over 2 divided by the velocity of time. After that interval of time, you reach the man and you register that this event has taken place. The other delta t, let's say, let's call this 1 and this 2. Delta T1, delta T2, the same. He sends a beam of light when the event takes place. And this delta T prime and delta T2 prime, the, we can say that the two events are simultaneous when these two intervals of time are the same. Okay? So an event happens, he sends a beam of light as soon as it happens. The other, as soon as it happens, his event sends a beam of light. If the two events are simultaneous, he reaches them. Uh, they reach the man at the same time, okay? Now let's go in a frame that move with constant speed. Okay, so we have this again. We have the man. But now we are uh, in a frame that moves uh, with constant, or otherwise we take this and move with constant velocity. Then... <coughs> in an interval of time delta t. So this one, this one sends a beam of light. This one sends a beam of light. But as this frame is moving with velocity v, this man is moving toward this object, object 2, object 2. OK, so here is moving away from this one. He sits at the L over 2. So when will he receive? He will receive after a time that is L over 2 divided by C, but then he has moved. Uh, uh, so there is the velocity with which he has moved by some small interval that is delta T1. OK, so you understand what I mean? He's moving, so he will reach light, will reach him, not 
with the same interval of time as before, but light has to travel a little bit further because this object has moved, this man has moved here. Okay? And uh, so, and as he has moved here, there is a distance delta x, and then the interval of time delta t1 uh, will be equal to L over 2 divided by c plus delta x, while the second interval of time is L over 2 times c minus delta x, because this one, this beam of light, does not have to travel L over 2, but it has to travel a distance that is less because this man has moved, because we are in a moving frame. Okay? So now delta T1 and delta T2 are not equal, so for him, the two events are not simultaneous. This is a crucial... If you have not... An delta X is this... is the distance cover to reach L2, okay? And then there is an extra piece because he has moved the man, so delta x. Okay, and then below, the delta 2 is uh, the same distance, but this man has moved in this direction, so I have to subtract this delta x. Okay, so this thing, delta t1, is different from delta t2. That means the two events are not simultaneous anymore for him. Okay, please. Any question? You are adding the, the distance and... Subtracting. Is delta x? Okay, delta x is the distance that this man has moved because we are in a moving frame. Okay? I mean the dimension. Okay, on the right we have... Uh... Oh, yes, you have, of course, to divide by c. You have to divide by C. Okay. Actually, no. You have to divide by um, V. You have to divide by V. Okay. So the first thing is events which are simultaneous in one frame are not simultaneous in another inertial one moving with constant uh, speed with respect to the other. This is the most important consequences. Now let's go and see uh, uh, all the... Remember the Galilei transformation law was x prime is equal x minus vt. And I said the Maxwell equation are not invariant under this. So there must be a different transformation law. And uh, the different transformation law now we will derive. What we will do? Um, let's do in the following manner. Well, you know, the, um, when you have the Maxwell equation, mostly uh, you have the Maxwell equation, but you can combine them having uh, in an equation that is the wave equation of the um, front wave of light expanding. So basically you have... Uh, uh, so you have a source and you have, if you take a spherical wave, you have a spherical wave moving out. And this is the essence of the uh, Maxwell equation. Now, which is, uh, can we describe this motion? Yes. This uh, motion of this front wave and the equation of motion of this is the following x squared plus y squared plus z squared is equal to c squared t squared. Okay, so if I want to describe all x, y, and z of a front of a spherical wave, and this spherical wave is light, is uh, changing with time, this is the equation. Now let's remember that the Einstein, that the um, um, uh, that the Galilei relativity, the Galilei transformation, the Galileo transformation, was x prime is equal x minus vt if we move along x so y remain the same z remain the same and t remain the same often this is said you know, that time is absolute uh, it does not change 
it is the same in all frames. That means the clock moves in the same manner in all frames. Now let's see if this, that is the equation of motion of um, derived from Maxwell equation, is invariant under this transformation. So now we will check if this equation of motion for the wave is invariant under this. OK, so let's put in uh, <coughs> uh, the new things. And what you will get is, uh, so uh, what we want? We want that uh, um, according to the first, that the law of motion don't change if we move into a new things. We want that this uh, spherical wave goes into a spherical wave. Why? Because uh, if we change a shape, that means, for example, this is a spherical wave, it becomes an ellipse, then there would be a manner to detect motion. So in order not to um, detect the motion according to the first principle, that the law of motion have the same form in going from one frame to another, it means this is the law of motion of the front wave, the spherical wave. We want that it remain the same in the new coordinate. Let's see if that is the case using this transformation. Now, so now we insert this transformation and what we get? We get x squared minus 2xvt plus v squared t squared plus y squared z squared equals c squared t squared. Now, there are three pieces that remain the same. But then there is these two extra pieces. So we want, you understand the point, huh? We want that as this is the law of motion of a spherical um, um, front light, it remains spherical so that there is no manner to detect motion with one with respect to the other. OK. And we have made the use this law and even made the further hypothesis that C is the same, there is these two extra pieces if we use this law of motion. So we have to find a manner to take them away. And you see these two extra pieces involve time. So we could try to do the following transformation. x prime minus equal x minus vt y prime equal y, z prime equal z. But then we could say, well, listen, because there is t and we have to get rid of this t in these because these pieces are the same. But there is these extra pieces, so they are not invariant. Let's suppose that t prime is equal to t plus f of x, where f is some factor that we could determine. OK. Uh, then. If we use this new transformation law, this equation would become the following, x squared minus 2xvt. So before I transformed according to this law, and now let's run, and I get this. Now let's instead do these same things, but using this law, OK? So, and uh, we get this plus v square t square plus y square plus z square equals c square t square plus 2 c square f t x plus c square f square x square. Now, <clears throat> this f has to be determined in order to get an equation that is like this. If we choose f to be minus v over c square, this equation becomes x squared 1 minus v squared over c squared plus y squared plus z squared plus equals, sorry, equals c squared t squared 1 minus v squared c squared. OK, so we have basically just to get rid of these two factor, or we get rid of these two uh, factor. Well, besides this, putting an f there, let's rescale everything by a particular factor. So let's forget about this. Now we know that the new law has this form, but still there is this extra piece. 
So in order to get rid of this extra piece, what we can do is divide by this extra piece, 1 minus v squared c squared, divide 1 minus v squared c squared. Then if you do this transformation, you get rid of this, and you return to this same form. So the transformation, the correct transformation, are x prime equal x minus vt, 1 minus v square c square, t prime, y prime equal y, z prime equal z, and t prime is equal t minus v c square x over 1 minus v square c square. I repeat what I did. I took uh, the spherical front wave. In new coordinates, I want that it has the same form because of the relativity principle. If it, uh, it, it were not uh, a sphere but uh, an ellipse, I would be able to detect the motion. Instead, I don't want to detect the motion in going from x to x prime, that are two frame, one moving with respect to the other with constant speed. That this is not what happens is if I insert the a Galilei transformation, I get these strange things. So I modify, and I modify it first just without this denominator, but modifying t. This is a very important thing. It means t is not an absolute variable anymore. t get changed. And I put a generic f without the denominator. I get that the new law becomes this. And if you choose f to be this quantity, you get down to this. Now you have only to get rid of this and this. And you can do that by putting a denominator here and here. So the final law, transformation law, is this. These are called Lorentz transformation. And this is how Lorentz basically found them. He looked at um, which are the transformation under which either the Maxwell equation or a spherical beam of light would remain the same in form, obeying the first principle. OK. Is this clear, any question? Now, of course, Lorentz, well, uh, he went further than this. Uh, and, uh, <clears throat> um, but now, these are the transformation. And look, immediately you see that if V is much less than C, then you do an expansion here, and you get that X is equal to X minus VT plus correction over V squared C squared, OK? And the same t, t prime is equal t plus correction v c square. You see, so basically, um, the Galilei transformation that we had before, that were just these, uh, are obtained by these when the velocity of the one frame with respect to the other is much smaller than c. So basically, the Galilei transformation were not. Uh, wrong. They were right in the correct regime that is called non-relativistic regime. That means when the velocity is much less uh, of the velocity of light. So Lorentz was happy about this. Now, you see, in the Maxwell equation, the only velocity involved is the velocity of light. And um, uh, somehow there we are always in a relativistic regime because the only quantity of interest is the things. Now let's see if we recover. You remember that um, these, uh, now we have to see if these transformations are consistent with this. With the first one, they seem to be consistent. They send spherical front line into spherical front line. Let's see if they are, uh, uh, remember that one consequence was uh, simultaneity. Uh, let's see how we get um, that simultaneity is not uh, preserving going from one frame to the other. Let's take the first, the second equation. T prime is equal T minus V C square X, 1 over V square C square. Okay, let's take uh, the differential of this. We get delta T prime is equal delta T minus V C square 
delta x 1 minus v square c square now let's remember the when we did the simultaneity things okay in the frame addressed delta t is equal zero the two events were simultaneous so the difference in time is simultaneous but delta x is different from zero then would you get that delta t prime is equal to minus v c square delta x 1 minus v square c square and uh, so from here you see that even if they were simultaneous the difference in time is delta t here they are not delta t prime is different from zero non simultaneous look they are actually simultaneous that means delta t prime goes to zero if uh, v is much smaller than c if v is much smaller than c this is basically zero and this is basically one and then you would get that delta t prime is equal zero so in the Galilean young, uh, in the Galilean frame um, in the Galilean non-relativistic framework uh, the delta t simultaneous would imply delta t equals zero if you are in this regime but if you are not in this regime of v being very small they are not simultaneous the interval of time between uh, the two so the two events are simultaneous their difference in time is delta delta t is equal zero when they uh, so basically they get delta t equals zero it means they reach the man the two signal at the same time because they the two events were simultaneous delta t prime different from zero it means one reach the person after the other so they are not simultaneous delta t prime is the difference in time to reach the man but it's also the difference in time that there is between the two events okay so somehow this uh, postulate that as a consequence as the uh, relativity of simultaneity is um, um, comes from this equation okay but now the point is this from the transformation law of x uh, we should be able to see how the velocity compose you remember uh, the composition of velocity in the Galilean um, frame okay note that we derive uh, it's not that we derived but uh, we have seen that O. Oh, Lorentz derived this transformation. You can say, oh, maybe there are other transformations that leave invariant if the, the spherical front wave is sent into a spherical front wave. In the book, in, in the first of the three books that I suggested, they do really with the Maxwell equation, but it's a little bit more complicated. I took this derivation instead, you will find in the note, but from the second book. Um, basically because at the end what is important is the light front wave spherical wave have to go into spherical wave otherwise you would be able to detect the relative motion now the next things we want to do is composition of velocity that means let's suppose we have an object that moves with velocity w then if we are in a relative frame moving with velocity v this is the mm, this is the velocity of an object a particle this is the velocity of the frame then the new velocity in the new frame is this okay this is the composition of velocity and this is the Galilean wave now let's see the composition of velocity here, why this is important? Because we have to, you know, we have derived uh, these things. Uh, but we want to see if what we derive is consistent with this, that C does not change in going from one frame to the other. Here, in the Galilean things, if the particle that moves is the photon and is moving at velocity C, 
it would change. The new velocity would be c minus v. Okay, but instead I have this postulate. So that says that c does not change. So I have to make sure that these transformations are consistent with this postulate. Okay, well, what we do? Let's take the differential of these and these. So we take the differential, we get dx prime is equal to dx minus v dt 1 minus v square c square and dt prime is equal to dt minus v c square dx 1 minus v square c square. I've taken the differentials of space and time of that equation. And now let's take the ratio of the two, dx prime over dt prime. So this over this. I do the same here. I get dx minus v dt, dt minus v c square dx. And uh, from here you get dx dt minus v. 1 minus v c square dx dt. Now, this is the velocity of my object that I call w minus v. And here I have 1 minus v c square w. Remember, w I call the velocity of my particle, and v the velocity, the relative velocity of one frame with respect to the other. So, this is the composition law. This one would be v prime, w prime. So w prime is equal to w minus v, 1 minus v c square w. This is the Einstein or Lorentz composition of velocity. Let's write it below here. w prime is equal w minus v, 1 minus v c square w. You see, it's different. But again, this one, so this is called Lorentz composition of velocity. W and W prime is the velocity of the particle in the two frame, v is the velocity of one frame with respect to the other. Now, can we go from one to the other? Yes. If v is much less than c, this is basically zero, and we are left with one, and you go into this. So again, with v much less than c, um, the Lorentz transformation goes into the normal Galilean transformation. But here now we see the important things. Let's suppose that the particle we have is a photon. It means it's going at the speed of light. So w prime is equal w minus v, 1 minus v c squared w. Now let's choose w to be a photon, so to move with c in the laboratory frame. Please. Let me see. Uh, this is W. Yeah, so we have to say that we have to be much more. Uh, not only V, but also W has to be less than C. So the particle has to move in the, is right, the W, the velocity in the laboratory frame has to be less than C and also V, the, f the velocity with respect one to the other. Now let's suppose that that object, that that particle that we are measuring is velocity is a photon, so is C. So let's put here C. We get C minus V, 1 minus V, C squared, C. And this is C. Do the calculation is C. So you see, the new velocity, you understand why C? This is, you get C, then you multiply, you get C. It cancels the denominator. It goes up and remains C. So. This object is C. That means the new velocity of that photon in the new frame is again C. So basically it has not changed. And then it is consistent with this. So this strange composition law is such that the velocity is, 
uh, invariant, and so it obeyed the second postulate of uh, relativity. There is, please. If there is only that transformation that preserve uh, that good question, I don't know. I, um, well, you know, you require various properties to the Lorentz transformation. First, that they are linear. You see, they are linear transformation. And you want that because you don't want to send the um, spherical uh, beam into a non spherical one with the. Po if, you know, if, you, if it were not linear, you would get, instead of x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals ct squared, you would get x cubed, x fourth, if it were not linear. So the request, I think, somewhere it must have been proven that the request of linearity um, and that it goes in the limit of small velocity into the Galilean one uniquely fix uh, the things. And then if you uniquely fix that, it you uniquely fix also the composition of velocity. And, but I, I cannot tell you where to look for the proof. There, are, there, there has been a lot of axiomatic done on, uh, that means, uh, um, done on this. And there, there is a book, I think, uh, Bridgman, an old book where everything was proved uh, in a very axiomatic way. I forgot the title. I think the author is. Uh, Bridgman, but I'm not sure. And, uh, Maybe for you send us. Yes, I have to look. Uh, it is a book I look 20 years, more than 20 years ago. So I have to find out. I'm an old man. So. OK. Uh, now, this is the composition of velocity along x. OK, you have seen. We have look only along x because the frame moves along x. Now, one question you can ask, and we will work out the mathematics now. If this frame moves one with respect to the other along x, do the uh, velocity, if the particle, mm, if we have a particle that has a velocity that is not only long x, but also long y, does it change? Uh, does it transform or remain the same? Here, for example, it would remain the same if you do the derivative, you would get that w y is equal to prime is equal to a w y. But let's see what happened instead in the relativistic case. So this is called the composition of velocity. Now, uh, slow me down, OK, because I know that I go fast. So um, I mean, some people might have already seen uh, this material and they understand uh, immediately, but some other of you might not have seen, so don't be ashamed to say slow down, I have understood nothing. Okay, and I will go through it again because we have enough time. Uh, I prefer, you know, to finish the 20 lectures in time than not uh, finish two lectures before or three and I've lost many of you. Okay, so last year what happened is I lost several people <laughs> And then they ask the question over the last two or three lectures. But I would prefer instead that you stop me. So don't be afraid or ashamed with respect to the others. I have not understood you went too quickly. And uh, so. OK, so now the uh, new things that we will do. You will see the, the, the pages for each uh, things are. Um, Label one, two, three, even with my terrible handwriting, and um, it's true italics. This handwriting, okay? Uh, you know, when on the computer you choose the character italics, that beautiful things. Uh, uh, that is not italics. Italics is this because I'm from Italy. So, and uh, anyhow, um, you will see that sometimes I insert pages. For example, on page seven of this note. I have inserted two other pages I call 7A and 7B. OK, so in case you. OK, uh, so now we want to see this is the Lorentz transformation. And you know, the point is that Lorentz made this transformation, but he did not believe in them because there were several crazy features like laws of simultaneity. And the fact that the composition of velocity would give me that C is the same, even if there were already experimental facts. So Lorentz found them mathematically. 
but did not believe in them in the physics. He said it's just a mathematical feature that the Maxwell equation are invariant at different set of transitions. It was Einstein that somehow he knew the work of Lorentz, but it was Einstein that uh, somehow realized that putting this postulate would immediately bring uh, in a lot of new stuff that is this. So now, okay, now let's do composition. of transverse velocity. So that means we have our particle whose velocity is w. Let's suppose it has a component along y. And we want to see how it relates to the new uh, one. Now, let's do the inverse of this. It's one of the homework. Uh, let's do the inverse of this. You get t equal t prime plus v c square x prime, 1 minus v square c square. And then from here, I did the inverse of this. Do as homework. is indicated in the pages as homework. Uh, <coughs> you do the inverse of this. Now let's take the differential, and we get dt equal dt prime plus v c square dx prime minus 1 over vc squared. You see, from this transformation, you should notice that now time is not an absolute parameter anymore. Uh, it involves x. So basically, people talk about space-time transformation, because here space and time are mixed one with the other. OK. Mm. OK, now let's insert this and this. That immediately implies dy prime is equal to dy here. So we have dy prime over dt prime plus vc squared dx prime 1 plus v squared c squared. And you get dy, let's divide everything by dt prime, 1 plus vc squared dx prime dt prime, 1 minus v squared c squared. Now, what is this? This is w prime y. Then I have divided by this. There is something there is something wrong in a sign, but let me There's a problem with the sign. Please do check my calculation. Um, OK, this is the transformation for uh, transverse velocity. So transverse velocity change in this manner. Sorry, this is Vx. This is Vx. So you see, even transverse velocity change. Even if we are moving along x, the transverse velocity of my particle change. It's not invariant anymore because time changes. So the manner it changes the following. Here it seems there was a plus, and I don't know why I lost it into a each one is minus, yeah. minus d of the c squared, right? This, you mean? No, it's plus. It's plus. Plus dt prime is plus. It's minus uh, the square root. Oh, yes, of course. And here is plus. Here is plus, but it's not right. <laughs> okay, there should be a minus. Just work out because you know this is the manner to do some 
gymnastic with these things is very important for the homework, okay? Um, to learn how to do this gymnastics. So note, different than in the Galilean case, in the um, uh, Lorentz Einstein case, the transverse velocity are not left invariant even if we move. We move along x, why the velocity along y of a particle should change? It should not change because we are moving only along x. Instead, it change. Okay. Note this. Now let's go. So this is uh, <clears throat> important because we will use later on. Tomorrow we will use this uh, transformation. But now let's go to one more important. Sorry, sorry. Uh, you will find in the note, OK? In half an hour, when we are finished, you will get it. And, uh, now, um, another consequence of this is what is called uh, contraction of length. And this is a very important issue. That is the one that Lawrence had already found and did not believe in it. And also Fitzgerald, an American one, had already found it. A consequence of the Lorentz transformation is the contraction of length. So let's take a road in the rest frame or laboratory frame. Rest frame or laboratory frame are the same. Let's suppose this is my road. And let's suppose this is his length. So in the laboratory frame, this is x2 minus x1. And in the move, now let's take a moving frame with velocity v. And let's measure its length. It will be x2 t prime minus x, x2 prime t prime, x1 prime t prime. Because uh, <clears throat> the, in the moving frame, I call the coordinate and time with a prime. OK, let's see what we get. OK, now you can do the inverse of this, express x as a function of x prime and t prime. And what you get is the following I wrote before. x is equal x prime plus v t prime over c squared. t is equal t prime plus v c square x prime 1 minus v square c square. OK, so let's see x to t prime. Note, I, the new length of this rod, you will see that is less. L is x1 of t prime, x2 of t prime. I take the same time. Because when I measure a distance, I take the extreme of the road and uh, I measure at the same time. So t is the same. This is very important. So let's see using this law. For example, x2, x2 from this is equal to x2 of t prime plus v of t prime, 1 minus v squared over c squared. And x1 is x1 of t prime plus v t prime 1 minus v square c square square root. Now let's take the difference of these two. We have x2 minus x1 that we know was the distance at length. Let's do the difference between the two right hand side. And what we get is x2 prime t prime minus x1 prime t prime, because these two cancel. And then divided by this, 1 minus v square over c square. But what is this? This is the length in the moving frame. So we get L0 is equal to L1 minus v square over c squared. That means L is equal L0 times 1 minus v squared over c squared. This factor is less than 1, so it means the distance measured 
in the moving frame is less than the distance measured in the rest frame. Now, <clears throat> I will not spend time here, but uh, this seems just mathematics, that there is length contraction, that the length are not something absolute uh, with... Um, in the Galilean case, it was because, you know, in the Galilean case, V is less than C. This is basically one, and then the length don't contract. Now, <clears throat> to what is due this uh, contraction? Well, it's due to the mathematics of that uh, formula. But Einstein found, which is the physics behind, I will skip that for the moment, is the manner you would measure a distance if you are in motion, okay, imagine this road, instead of um, being um, addressed, this road, let's suppose that uh, this road is on a train that moves, and you are on the platform, and you want to measure that road that moves. The only manner is that these send you a signal, these send you a signal, and then you measure. Well, because the two signals are sent, and the fastest velocity they can send it is... Uh, the velocity of light, then uh, there is all a construction that you can find if you read that beautiful book of Einstein, The Meaning of Relativity, <clears throat> that there is no other manner to measure a distance <clears throat> uh, in a rest frame, a distance that is moving, than some set of operation that leads you to this formula. So I got this only mathematically, <clears throat> and I prefer to get it that way. But in The Meaning of Relativity, Einstein this contraction, again, was not due to Einstein, was due to Lawrence and Fitzgerald, who did not believe in it. I mean, come on, distances don't contract. Instead, Einstein did a Gedanken experiment, that means uh, uh, an experiment in his mind, saying, oh, we would, we would measure a distance, a road on a train that moves, and we are on the platform. And the only operation you can do, because, again, of this postulate, he said that the distance you get is uh, less than the original one in the rest frame. Now, lo let's look at these uh, things, because not only this tells us about contraction, but it tells us also something else. Imagine that C is the maximum velocity that you can reach. Because you see here, if you add a V bigger than C, you would get a negative number, so an imaginary length. So C is the maximum velocity that you can reach. The distance uh, uh, would get an imaginary uh, thing. Now there is an extra, um, so length get contracted and um, interval of time get deleted. And now we will derive that, deletion of time interval. So I often, uh, it happens at least, uh, that one uh, <coughs> question that I uh, often ask is, uh, why C is the maximum velocity? Otherwise, the contract in the contraction of length, if you had a velocity V of the frame bigger than C, you would get imaginary length. Now, time dilation is another phenomenon. Now let's go back to this uh, formula, the one that we had uh, before. Let's, this one, let's take this one. We get delta t is equal delta t prime plus v c zero delta x prime one minus v square over c square. Now let's suppose two events this is the distance in space of two events. This is the distance in time of two events. Let's suppose two events take place in the same position, but one after another, one at time t1, another at time t2, but at the same point. Then delta x is equal to 0. So we get delta t is equal to delta t prime 1 minus v squared c squared. So this is the interval of time in the moving frame, and this is the interval of time in the uh, rest frame. And uh, 
you see that uh, the interval of time in uh, the uh, rest frame has, is bigger than in the other frame, okay? So this is the phenomenon of time dilation. And uh, uh, there is a mistake again. No, sorry, we have to take this one. Uh, we have to take this one, not this one. Okay, so we get this one. Okay, so the two events take place in the same uh, position x, but at different instant of time, and this is delta t. Okay, now you see that the interval of time in the moving frame is bigger than in the rest frame by this factor. Okay, because this factor is less than 1, but is in the denominator, so it's dilated. It's, um, so when you move, in a frame that moves, length are contracted and interval of time instead are dilated. Okay. Now you can ask, okay, well, time get dilated, length get contracted, but there is any quantity that remain the same? Yes. These are called invariant quantity. Now, in the Galilean case, what was invariant? The interval of time. Because t, in the Galilean case, t was equal to t prime. So delta t is equal to delta t prime. So it was an invariant thing. And also, that in the also, uh, interval of space were invariant. So these were the Galilean thing, but it's not so anymore in uh, the Lorentz case. So this is Galilean things. So if I ask you, which are the invariants, the things that don't change in going from one frame to the other in the Galilean case? The length, the interval of time, OK? The position is not invariant. You know, the position, the Galilean things is this without the denominator. The position change in the Galilean things. But if you do the delta x and there is no denominator, OK, then this does not change. And if they are, remember that when we took time dilation, we took time, dil uh, time, uh, time dilation or, or space contraction, we did the delta x but the delta t we put equal 0 because we measure the two, ins the two extreme of the road at the same time. Okay. Now let's see, in the, so in the Lorentz case, Lorentz Einstein. This was not in the original paper of Einstein and it was not in the original paper of, um, um, but it was in a later work and the one that is responsible for this is Minkowski. Basically, what is invariant is the following quantity. Even if you go in a moving frame, this quantity remains the same. OK? So this is the quantity, a combination of space and time, that does not change under a Lorentz transformation. Now we will prove it. So length contract, time interval get deleted. But there is this. Uh, quantity that does not change. And also its square root does not change. OK, so now we will prove that this quantity is the quantity x squared minus ct squared is equal to x prime squared ct prime squared. If you do this strange combination, then things don't uh, change. So let's start and let's do that calculation. Let's take the right hand side x prime square minus c square t prime square. Let's insert this. We get x minus vt square, 1 minus v square c square, minus c square t 
minus x v c square square 1 minus v square c square x square minus 2x v t plus v square t square c square t square minus 2 p x v c square plus x square v square c four 1 minus v square c square so let's do this calculation we get x square minus c square t square minus x square v square c square plus v square t square c square over c square plus 2x vt minus 2x vt over 1 minus v square c square this cancel with this and what you get is x square minus c square t square 1 minus v square c square over 1 minus v square c square and so you are left with x minus c t square so this is the proof that in the two frame this quantity is the same so it's not true that uh, as people uh, say there are no absolute quantity in um, Einstein relativity no there are absolute quantity are these this quantity are absolute quantity. Now, of course, uh, this is the distance from the origin. X is the, um, uh, we could say in general, this. So an interval in X minus C squared plus an interval in time is the same. It does not change if you go to new coordinate okay now <clears throat> of course as this is the same also the square root is the same This quantity has a name and uh, it's called, it depends how you look at it. If you look at it in this manner, you see that this has the dimension of delta x and it's called proper length. So, proper length is delta x squared minus c squared delta t squared. But if you write in the other manner, that means the opposite of this, uh, c square, oh, sorry, you write this manner, delta t square minus delta x square over c square, then this is called the proper time, because it has the dimension of time, and also this is Lorentz invariant. Now, okay. Now, let's see if it has, besides having this uh, geometrical meaning of this strange combination, if it has uh, also a physical meaning. You see, mm, let's take proper time, that is the one that we will use uh, most. Um, you know, basically this is uh, the time in the frame that moves uh, with the particle. That means you have a particle moving with velocity v. This is the time in, uh, um, uh, if you are just uh, uh, moving with the particle at the same speed v. 
How can we prove that? Now let's see. How we put. Now before going before going into so let's take now only the mathematical meaning of this. <clears throat> and uh, uh, let's uh, draw these. Uh, uh, before doing that, we will do next time just uh, one thing I wanted to do, and is the um, okay. Let's do this drawing. Okay, this is the line x equals ct, this is the line minus x equals ct. Now, you see, if we take, let's take three different points, O, A, C, and B. You know, this distance um, is called space-like distance. Uh, it is called space-like distance because you see delta x is bigger than c delta t squared. So OB, uh, or this distance, is called space-like distance. This one, delta x is equal to ct, so it's 0. This is called light, um, light distance. This one, delta x, delta x is less than c delta t, and this is called time-like distance. These two points, okay, can be reached by O, A can be reached by a signal starting from O, in, uh, even if the signal moves at a, at a speed less than C. This one can be reached only if the signal moves at, at a speed equal C. This one can never be reached. You have to move at a, at a speed bigger than C, okay? So these one, they say, are causally disconnected. Or they say these are out of the light cone. The light cone is this area. Okay, Light cone, because here is light that propagates, and light cone is the one inside. And every point inside can be reached by signal moving at less than the speed of light, while points that are outside cannot be reached by, can only be reached by signal moving faster than light, and you see from there. So these are called space-like point, and also they are causally disconnected because you need a speed higher than the speed of light. Well, let's stop here. <clears throat>